How's everybody doing tonight? Good? All right. Everybody can hear me in the back? All right. Still trying to catch my breath. I ran a 5K this morning, so. All right. Give everybody a second to get their seats. Alrighty. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit about me. My name is Adam Susi. Uh, I'm a WordPress developer sometimes now, as it, uh, because I'm now the CEO of Dinosaur Iceberg, which is an Orlando-based agency. Uh, but I'm also the, the chief marketing officer and a fill-in bartender at my family's restaurant called Granddaddy's. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talk talking about today. So one thing we, uh, we all love about client relations because this job would, would be great if it wasn't for the customers. <laughs> At the end of the day, though, it is all about them. Because the customer is always right. It's the most cliche thing in the world. And if you talk to, if you talk to Randall from Clerks, he's going to say the customer is always a colorful word. But at the end of the day, especially in this business, the site is their baby, not yours. And you... Especially developers have a hard time getting over that because you know it's it's my code. I, you know I, I created it. I gave I gave birth to it, but it belongs to someone else. And you have to remember that when push comes to shove, you, you may make make a recommendation, and you use the term "it is my professional recommendation," but at the end of the day, it's their choice. They may want to use Comic Sans. You know it's a bad idea. It's worse than papyrus. <laughs> but it's still, the, if they insist on it for whatever reason, it's at the end of the day, th they're right. Even when they're wrong, they're right. Now, sometimes they want to make a change, but it's, maybe it's out of scope. Maybe it's something that you've already built this, and we're, you know, we're at the end of the project, and suddenly they're like, you know what? I know my color scheme was, you know, primary colors. Now I've decided everything's neon because we've just changed our branding. Now you have to go back and do, redo like 10 hours worth of work to fix everything. You shouldn't just do that for free. Changes are okay, but they come with a cost. And even when, when it seems like it's in scope, if it's, gonna, it's something that's going to take you a whole bunch of time, I mean, 10 hours, that's, a day, that's over a, a day's worth of work. Or, if you're like me, half a day's worth of work. So, you want to make sure that you're getting your money's, uh, your money's worth as well, because your, t your time means something, and they, they should have to pay for that. Beyond that, you want to make sure that you're projecting a positive in image and energy. Kind of like I'm not doing right now, because I'm so nervous. Your appearance really matters, not just the way you dress, but the way you present yourself when you're talking to a client. Um, this is something, a, a huge thing that I learned when I, was, when I worked at Disney. Everyone jokes about, like, do, do they really write people up for not smiling enough? And the fact is, yes, they do. But there's a reason for it. When you're walking around Disney, and you may be having a bad time, but you keep seeing, seeing all these smiling, happy people that are working there, even though you know that their jobs suck, you start going, well, maybe, this, maybe today's not going so bad. Just because enthusiasm is contagious. Why do you think so many people start their presentations and their talks with, how's everybody doing today? And they're all jumpy and happy and excited. It gets everyone to feel better, and suddenly they're in a good mood. No matter what's just happened, suddenly they're, feel, they're feeling good, even if it's for five seconds. But that five seconds can make all the difference in how they perceive what you're about to say. Especially when things go wrong. Uh, uh, I caught the, the, the end of one of the talks before, uh, when I first got here, and they were talking about being uh, in the wise mind, and I thought that was, it's a very, except pretty much what I'm talking about here. Client emails you, everything is blown up. If you're just like, well, that sucks. They're not going to handle that well. That's going to make them freak out even more than they already are. 
But if you're like, nope, it's all good. Everything's fine. We're, we're going to take care of this. I'm right here with you. We're, we're a team. Everything's going to be fine. They're going to suddenly calm down, feel better. I keep trying to tell myself that my, right now. Calm down, feel better. Everything's going to be fine. Every cust customer ever is going to ask you so something that you probably already asked them, and they said, no, I'm fine. Like, could I get some mayo for my sandwich? I've lost count of how many times I would ask someone that, when taking an order, is there anything else you'd like on your sandwich? No, I'm good. I drop the sandwich off. Oh, could I get a side of mayo? There have been times where I said, we, like, I recognize the customer for having asked it a previous visit. Would you like mayo on your sandwich? No, I'm fine. Drop the sandwich off. Could I get some mayo? <laughs> They're always going to forget something they actually really need, like hosting. They're like, oh, yeah. I, that's, it's why I always ask about hosting at the, at the very beginning of a, conversa uh, of a co conversation with a client. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I don't have that yet. Who do you recommend? I've got a couple of recommendations I won't talk about them just in case of bias or anything like that, but you got to make sure that you think about the common questions and prepare your answers. Bringing this back into the restaurant context, think about you go to a McDonald's. They actually are really good with their suggestive selling techniques. It, everyone knows about, would you like fries with that? That's, that's the famous one. What you may not have noticed, and maybe it's because I go to McDonald's way too much, They've shifted a little bit, especially when it comes to you get an extra value meal. Instead of just asking, like, oh, what size would you like? They ask you, would you like a Coke? Instead of just saying, what would you like to drink? Would you like a Coke? Because A, McDonald's has a marketing relationship with Coca-Cola. So they're going to push the primary product. That's part of their job. But also, they know most people are probably going to order a Coke. Even to the point where the last time I was there, the guy didn't even bother to ask me what I wanted to drink. He just gave me a Coke. That I was actually, that's taken it a little bit too far. You never just want to set somebody up like, oh, I like this hosting company, so I'm going to go ahead and set it. I've set up your account. Everything's good. What, what do you mean it's $45 a month? Oh, you mean that wasn't in your budget? Yeah, don't go that far, but have a couple recommendations. So if you know, like, it's a perfect, the dichotomy of the two, two hosting companies. W, WP Engine starts at $30 a month. If you, your client's entire budget for the project is $1,000, you're not going to recommend WP Engine. There's nothing against WP Engine. It's just you know they're probably not going to be able to afford it. So you're going to want to make sure you have a, a backup option. Even if WP Engine is your go-to source because they're a great company, you want to make sure that you have a backup. No matter, even, even if it's even if it's something that, you know, that's only like 3 or $4 a month, have that available to you. And always remember that you could still afford a doctor if you bought a PC. I'm pretty sure Bill Gates said that. And please tell me somebody gets that reference. Epic Rap Battles of... Okay, I, I figured David would, but... <laughs> okay. Um, so, more than anything, this is, this is the hardest lesson my family's restaurant has actually learned because we're in a very small town. Your market determines your success. Our restaurant has actually, especially the last few months, has really struggled because the town itself is going through some struggles. The people that live in the town have been hit harder by the economy than, even though like most of the economy is improving, things are not so great in this small town. And even though we're right outside Orlando, and Orlando is actually doing pretty well, this small town called Harmony is actually filled with people that they bought their houses really cheap because of the economic downturn. And now that property taxes have gone up and they're starting to get a little bit buried, they don't go out to eat nearly as much as they did even a year ago. Well, that's not good when you're the one of two restaurants in town. And you, rel you rely on those people. So if people can't afford to go out, they're not going to. They're not going to intentionally overspend. Um, there are a lot of potential clients. Not all of them can afford your prices, which is why you have to think about... I, we could have a whole seminar on properly pricing a project, but at the end of the day, 
you can only charge what people will actually pay you. So you could decide, I'm charging $10,000 minimum. Great. You're going to go out of business if nobody in your market can actually afford that. If, if every, every, there may be 100 different clients all wanting your services. Every one of them has a maximum budget of three grand. If you're charging 10, they're not going to pick you because they can't afford you. They're not going to put themselves out of business just to keep you in business. And that's it. Uh, my slides are actually already up, and I think it's been tweeted, as long as Twitter's auto-tweeting thing worked. Um, I'm at Adam Susi on Twitter. Um, my website is adamsusi.com. My company's website is not done, so please don't go to it. <laughs> I think we might have time for questions. Oh, I went faster than expected. Anybody? No? I'll be right on that. Well played, well played. Anybody else? No? no? All right, super quick. Oh, there we go. Yes. Well, a lot of it has to be, before you go into business, you should have a pretty good understanding of what your market is. When you're coming up with your initial pricing, that's not, so it also works in the positive way. Because if you notice that basically every time you send out a contract or, or, a, or a proposal, they're signing without asking any questions and without complaining that, oh, this seems like it's a little too much. You're not charging enough. So... It, it, work, it does work both ways, but when you're, when you're first looking at things, you want to make sure that, like, look at, you know, was it, what kind of businesses are you going after? If you're going after startups, they're going to have limited budgets. But if you're going after enterprise clients, they usually have a budget for things. The one exception, and this, it's, it's a weird, maybe it's a weird Orlando thing. Um, I don't know about the rest of Florida. Um, there's a huge hospital chain down here uh, called Florida Hospital. They seem like they're a really big corporation. And in, a, in one sense, they are, because they do make a lot of money. But the way they run their business is very different than me, most people realize, in that each individual hospital, especially on the marketing side, has its own little budget. And in that sense, they're run very much like small businesses. So at my old agency, that uh, before I went freelance and then founded this company, one of the things that we did was we did a lot of work on small hospital sites. Uh, usually internal stuff. And we're thinking, they're Florida Hospital. They, of course they've got the budget for this. When we, after we did a couple of them because they were really happy, we, we were in the process of ra raising our rates. They were the first people to say, well, if you guys do this, we can't afford you anymore. So we thought they would be able to afford it, and they just, they, they were honest. They said, if you guys change your prices, we're going to go somewhere else. So you have to just kind of be aware, listen, talk to your, your, your potential clients, talk to your your current clients, if they're like, hey, if it, it's, it's been a year since we've redone your site. If we were to start the site today, re, pretend we never worked together, if we were going to start today, how much would you be willing to pay? That'll help give you a much better gauge of what your market's, what your market's willing to do for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of it is... It's going out there and talking to people. Like I was saying, is talk to other developers in your... Uh, are you more of a developer or a designer? Okay. Talk to other designers in your area. Go to, go to local meetups. Um, be mindful that depending on who goes to those meetups, you may have a lot of freelancers versus a lot of agency people. Or people that have been established for a long time can charge a lot more than someone that's new. It's just the reality of the business. No, even if your skill... You, you may be infinitely more talented, and because I've seen brand new people that are infinitely more talented than people that have been doing this for 10, 15 years. That's just, some people are just really good at what they do, and they've just never put themselves out there. So you have to be aware that just because you've been doing it for a long time doesn't mean you can, you can necessarily... Markets tend to value experience more, way more than they should over talent. 
talent eventually wins out in the end, but at least when you're starting out, you kind of have to get your feet wet a little bit and build yourself up. That's um, Mark's talk about building your brand, how, how you're, you don't own your, your reputation at the end of the day. That's part of it because you're new. Nobody knows you. You don't have a reputation, but this person's been doing it for 15 years. So make sure when you talk to people, you keep that in mind as well. That's an excellent point. Um, she's, uh, just so in case for the recording, what she's talking about is to get started, a great way to do it is to become basically a white label service for, a sm for an agency where you're never actually directly interacting with the clients. You, won't, for your, you yourself, you're only managing one client, but they're doing the managing for 5, 10, 15 clients. Exactly. It, it helps you uh, keep your low prices. It's also a really great way to, to grow your business to the point where my, my new company is actually comes directly out of that relationship. I was doing dev work for a, a company that had recently lost their developer. They were very good with marketing, but they, they needed someone to build the sites that they were trying to sell. We enjoyed our working relationship so much that we decided to go into business together. So it, it's, it's a great way, to, it's a great way to, to not only meet new people, but also help grow your, grow your reputation with a little bit of a safety net as well. That's a great question. Uh, the question was, is it better to approach local franchisees versus, or the parent company? Especially if you're a freelancer, you're going to want to go with the local franchisers, but also be aware that they may not have the final say. Um, we actually, as we were putting together our company, we, were, we had a, a chance for a really big project that if, if we, we started as, uh, as four people, everyone as, as a partner in the agency, we would have immediately had to hire at least one person, if not two, if we got this contract. The problem was we were a tiny upstart company competing literally against Wix.com. So when the court, well, even though we had a great in with the, the person we were talking to, at the end of the day, they, their corporate structure felt much more comfortable dealing with an established company with a huge name, regardless of their quality. So it, 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 for them, it, the name, especially when you're dealing with, with bigger, bigger companies like that, name really means something because they also feel like they can utilize that, some, leverage a partnership or maybe find some other way to work together that saves them even more money. It depends. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, I can't really speak f f definitively on this, but it probably depends on the franchisee and what they're allowed to do because they may execute a contract with you and then you find out after you, you bill them and they disappear and you, you know, it's obviously the worst case scenario, but you know, they, they disappear and they don't pay you and you go after them and like you try to go after the corporate, you know, like Let's say you're dealing with a McDonald's franchise. You're going after corporate McDonald's, and McDonald's is like, we didn't authorize them to do this. They never had the right to, to get into this contract, so there's nothing we can, we can do for you. So you have to be very careful when it, when it comes to that. Make sure that, and really this is the case for any contract relationship you get into, is make sure that the person that's putting their name on the contract is allowed to, because if, they, if they're not, someone can overrule you, and suddenly you're dealing with a whole different set of legal problems and you're still out money. So. Yes. Qu 
uh, the question was the two greatest lessons I wish I would, I'd known before I started. Um, the first one is make sure that you have a lot of money saved up. Uh, because the beginning of starting any business, the beginning of going freelance, I, I, I took a huge risk when I did go freelance because I knew I had some stuff lined up, but if I hadn't, I would have been in big trouble because I'm not the best person at putting myself out there and just trying to sell. Once you, if you give me a warm introduction, I'll talk their ear off, but I have this innate fear of talking to people. That's, it's a miracle I'm, I'm still, I haven't passed out. So make sure that you have a nice nest egg that can pay your bills. Otherwise, you're going to be like me sometimes where I'm going, I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage this month just because it's been a slow month in sales. Or I know March, April, and May are awesome because we've already booked these clients and we're, we're going to be invoicing them on March 1st, April 1st, and May 1st. But it's February and I haven't gotten paid in six weeks. That, and those things will happen. There's dr weird dry spells. Uh, last year, when I was going through this, I got 10 leads in January from, uh, from just my basic contact form without even trying. I didn't get any the rest of the year. So it's, it's really weird how, how things work. The second lesson is also make sure that you have projects lined up to get started because you'll find, um, again, it's a whole separate talk, but depression is hell. Everybody, anyone that's been through it knows that. A very easy way to get yourself stuck in depression is to be a freelancer that doesn't have work. It's a very scary period. So if you know, like, if you're thinking about leaving a, leaving a job, make sure you kind of put yourself out there, like, get used to, like, work at night and do a few things on the side and make sure you're used to, like, you understand how the, you're going to run a freelance business and you're okay with how that all works. Because if you don't, you're going to get overwhelmed by all these new things that you have to do. Like, if, when you're working for a company, you never have to worry about an accountant or a lawyer or what happens when somebody pays with a fake credit card, which happened to me. And I ended up having to pay 10 grand back to the people that it was stolen from. So... I'll, yeah, you asked for two. Third one, vet your clients. Make sure that they are who they say they are. My general rule, my general rule now is I will not work with someone that I cannot at least see in person via Skype and have multiple conversations with to make sure that they are a real person that is going to pay me with real money that is theirs and not something they stole. Because it is a nightmare to go through, especially now with the, the advent of the chip card has made it hell for businesses. It's great for consumers, but it's hell for businesses. Mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest way, the, the conversation is the, is the biggest part. Um, obviously, Google them. Make sure you can actually find out who they are. Is it the same way, like, handle it like you would you were going to a new doctor or a new, um, a new lawyer or an accountant. Like, the same way you would vet the people you're going to trust your personal information with, you're doing... You're, you want to do the same thing because at the end of the day, because the customer is always right and they're the one paying you, if they disappear or worse, they pay you with fake information, you're the one that's left holding the bag, either because you've done a bunch of work you're not going to get paid for, or worse, you've done a bunch of work you're not only not going to get paid for, but you actually have to pay for the privilege of doing the work that you didn't, aren't going to get paid for. Two, they're kind of different questions, but uh, um, first one was, do I do credit checks? I probably should, um, but they can be expensive and they're complicated, and we don't deal with the kind, I, I don't deal with the level of client that I'm really that worried about it, but maybe after that hard lesson, I probably should be. Um, the second question was, do I use PayPal? I have had one client that requested it. It was a little bit awkward because I didn't want to do it because it just made dealing with QuickBooks kind of a pain in the butt at first. But once I learned how to, how to integrate it with QuickBooks, it's like any other thing. So I don't, it doesn't really bother me.
Yeah, it, it can be. Um, the problem is when you're first starting out, um, PayPal has this weird thing where um, it, when there's not a direct goods transaction, like, oh, hey, I got this product, like, e like it, it does on eBay, they will hold your money for up to 21 days, and the client has the ability to determine whether how long that lasts, because they can say, like, oh, yes, I've received these services, it's great, go ahead and give them the money. But they can also, I think, turn around and say, no, this was a huge problem, don't give them my money. And PayPal tends to always back the the, the clients, not the, the business, in part because of all the horrible things that happened in the early days of eBay where people got scammed. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, the question was, what would I recommend if, uh, if you're dealing just through PayPal? Um, it, it, I'd probably say is don't, but... Sign contracts is the is the most important part, yeah. But um, I, my general rule with everything that I deal whenever I deal with clients is, I, I I try to do everything through email once I've met them, even phone conversations. I send a recap email like within minutes usually, and say like, here's all the things that we talked about. Did I miss anything? And I, I basically I put them in a position where they have to confirm that yes, everything that you said is correct. Because it, it's a written document of these are all the things that actually, these are the things that we discussed. So that way, the more documentation you have in general when something goes wrong, the better it is for you. But even so, some, comp, some like PayPal, like sometimes the deck is, the deck is just stacked against you and they're going to defend the, the client no matter what. Um, I know, I think it's American Express, when somebody uh, distribu disputes a charge, they automatically side with it side with uh, the client. Don't care about the business at all. It's why a lot of companies, even restaurants, don't take American, American Express because they know people, uh, like I, I have a friend that runs a restaurant. He refuses to take American, American Express for that exact reason because too many people have called and gone back on charges even though he has the signed receipt. Because in a restaurant, all you need is a signed receipt that says, yes, this person ordered all of these things, they, paid, they signed for it, they paid for it. But for whatever reason, American Express doesn't care. Good? Still got a little bit of time if anybody has any other questions. Yep. Yeah, the, only, the one client that I do have that I take PayPal from, the only reason I do is because it's an established client from a friend of mine that he confirmed that this guy always pays on time, there's never a problem, and he'd had him as a client for two and a half years before he just became too busy and had to pass him on to someone else. That's the only reason I even took him as a client. Any other questions? All right, thank you.